Hello, my name is Joanne Doe. I'm a practitioner at Natural Healing Center, and I'm going to be hosting our Facebook Live tonight. And the topic is healthy cooking trips, do's and don'ts. So um, feel free to say hello if you're joining me here, and I appreciate your time, whether you're live or you're catching the replay uh, later on. I do this Facebook Live every Thursday at 5.30, and if there's ever a topic that you'd like to see discussed, you can feel free to let me know in the comments, and I'm happy to um, take a look, do a little research, and get back to you on that. So. Um, healthy cooking tips. So the food choices that we make are really important to our health, um, but what also plays a role is how we prepare those foods. So certain cooking methods will ensure that we get the most health benefits, while other ones can potentially change the makeup of our food in ways that could potentially harm our health. So I'll be sharing some simple do's and don'ts. And it's always, you know, good, better, best with these. You don't have to be perfect and I'll kind of give you some examples uh, as we go along. Um, but one thing that you want to make sure that you're doing is washing your fruits and vegetables. So pest, um, primarily because of um, pesticides that you find in these kinds of foods. Um, so you want to go organic if possible. If budget is a concern for you, there's um, something, there's two lists that the Environmental Working Group put out every year. So one list is called the Dirty Dozen, and those foods contain the most amount of pesticides. So if I remember off the top of my head, it would be like um, strawberries, spinach, celery. So those ones would be in your best interest to go organic with. Um, However, they do um, create another list and it's called the Clean 15 and those fruits and veggies have the least amount of pesticides. So if you were going to go conventional, then those would be the ones to do it with. So I think pineapple and avocado are on there. You'll have to look up the rest. Um, but yeah, go organic if you can. Um, if not, you know, refer to those lists. Um, but what, there's a few different methods that you can use to wash your veggies really well. So my go-to is doing a water and vinegar soak and you may see on different like websites it'll say one to two parts or one to three parts or four parts i think any of them is fine actually so you just want to soak your uh, fruits and veggies in part water part vinegar and let them rest there for at least five minutes i'd say and then after that give them another good rinse um, a scrub if necessary um, other options would be be like a salt water soak and um, I believe it's like 10% salt water um, to the rest regular water and you can soak that solution in those that solution for five to ten minutes and then um, that takes a lot of the residues from the four most common pesticides and then another option is doing a baking soda and water soak so um, from what I've read it's one ounce baking soda to a hundred ounces of water and you want to soak for about 12 to 15 minutes in that solution and then rinse with water again there are like veggie washes that you can buy I know like Lugol solution is another one that we recommend for clients and there's probably a bunch of others on the market but um, really when it comes down to it is just taking the time to rinse and soak your vegetables, okay? So let's go on to um, cooking and what are the best cooking methods. So what I recommend would be using moist heat cooking methods. So what I mean by that are, um, it would be like options like steaming or boiling your food in water or broth. And you could do different variations of that. So it could be boiling, simmering, poaching, or blanching. But what's great about moist heat cooking methods is that um, it allows the cooking to be done at lower temperatures. And in, in that, uh, because of that, you can lock in the most nutrients from your foods. And um, if you want to add some more flavor, then instead of water, you can also cook in a broth. But um, I would focus on either 
water or broths and not like um, poaching or you know simmering in like milks and stuff like that. Um, when it comes to vegetables, uh, steaming would trump boiling um, because when you boil vegetables, you may have water soluble vitamins like vitamin B and, vit and vitamin C leach into the water. Whereas when you steam it, all the nutrients stay intact. Um, but what you can do is afterwards is that you can, um, for after, if you choose to boil, you can um, consume the water that it's cooked in that has the nutrients in um, by either drinking it or you can save it for a stock or sauces. That's way that way you keep all the nutrients from the food. Um, and another uh, option, so like boiling is at like a higher heat and then just slightly below that would be simmering your food and then at a even a little lower than that would be considered poaching your food and I think those are also really great methods to use too um, and poaching I think is like underrated as well so you can poach eggs sometimes I poach seafood like wild caught salmon and then I use the broth um, or the cooking liquid as a broth for like soups and stuff like that with the salmon itself and then I also you know when I meal prep for the week I meal prep for my dogs too they get like um simmered chicken and veggie toppers um and so when you're simmering the chicken it's nice because it um shreds up really well um, so um, you can play around with those options and if you're new to poaching and you're not sure if, hi Sandra, thanks for joining. Um, if you're new to poaching then uh, and you're not sure if your meat is cooked, then you can use a meat thermometer and you want to make sure chicken is cooked to 165 degrees and um, beef and pork, those want to be at an internal temperature of 145. So moist heat methods are really great, especially because they don't require you to add um, additional fats like oil or butter and so if weight loss or weight management is one of your goals moist heat methods will help to keep calories down and something to keep in mind is that the shorter the cooking time the better the cooking method is most likely for preserving nutrients so you want to be cooking your veggies until they're just tender but not much mushy and um, another method you could try with moist heat is blanching. So like say with broccoli, you are plunging the broccoli in boiling water for not too long, maybe a few minutes. And then if you want, you can run them under cold water to stop the cooking process or put them in ice water right away. But with that short amount of time, you have like minimal nutrient loss, which is really good. Another great option uh, for cooking foods that, in void of, that involves uh, moist tea is pressure cooking. So pressure cooking is uh, using a special kind of appliance that allows for higher temperatures and hence faster cooking times. So the cooking time is a lot shorter than boiling and fewer nutrients are lost in the process. So things like an Instant Pot would work really well. But the same thing with boiling foods, you're going to have some nutrients that gonna or will leach into the cooking liquid. But again, um, you're welcome to um, keep that liquid. You can drink it. You can use it for sauces and stocks. Um, and that's a way to make sure that you retain all the nutrients from your food. And when in regards to cooking meat in a pressure cooker, I mean, it's really fast. That's a great benefit, but also um, unsaturated and saturated fat, which is the fat you want to be mindful of, um, is also reduced by pressure cooking. So that's good news too. So um, I understand if you don't necessarily want to just boil and steam all your food, um, you might be thinking like, oh, well, what about, you know, baking or roasting or grilling or um, sauteing, you know, putting things in a frying pan, stir frying and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about that next. And we that's con those methods are considered dry heat methods and um, they may call for, you know, added fats or not. I'm going to get into that. But with dry heat methods, you know, you can use them from time to time as well. But there's a, there's a way that you want to do it too. So you want to make sure you're doing it the right way. 
So with roasting, say you're putting like a tray of veggies in the oven to cook, or you're cooking like a whole sheet pan of baked chicken, um, something to note is that due to the high heat, roasting can actually damage vitamins like vitamin D C and most B complex vitamins. And if you're adding additional fat um, to the cooking, then it can also uh, damage vitamin A and vitamin E too. So um, one thing I recommend is, you know how if you're looking at recipes online and they might say, oh, you know, um, oh, marinate your veggies or your protein in oil before putting it into the oven. I would suggest against that because what you're essentially doing is cooking your food in like hot fat or hot oil, kind of like you were like frying it. You know, I know it's not as hot, but it's like that similar principle. So what I would do is um, I would season your food well before putting it into the oven, say with a good quality salt, like Himalayan salt or sea salt, um, herbs and spices that don't have any additives. And then you can place it into the oven dry, so without any oil. And then once the food is done cooking, you'll take it out, you'll let it cool slightly, and then you're welcome to add some um, like raw olive oil or um, you know sesame seed oil, whatever you'd like on top and that way you get to have the um the, you get to keep the integrity of those good fats and get the most health benefits out of them so it's important to keep your fats balanced that means like what i mean by that is like your hot fats and your cold fats so example of hot fats would be like heated fats like say with me you're cooking like steaks or bacon or hot dogs or hamburgers um, other examples would be like um, things that have been cooked and heated in oil like so like fried foods like potato chips french fries fried chicken even um you know roasted nuts and seeds those would be examples of heated fats because they're essentially you know nuts and seeds have a lot of fat and you're heating them up when you roast them um, and then dairy which has a pasteurized dairy specifically which has been heated up to a certain temperature um, in the processing of it and so that could be like milks butter cheese yogurt on the other hand cold fats would be things that have been like unheated so they are um, like extra virgin olive oil that hasn't been heated up it's like the oil that you put right on top of your salad um, sesame seed oil that's unheated same thing with avocado oil avocados themselves since they are a um, healthy fat source and they're not heated so avocado avocado oil would be like in a cold fat um, raw nuts and seeds again not roasted but raw and then also raw dairy so raw milk raw butter um, raw cheese that type of thing um, so what can happen is if we're not paying attention is that there's a tendency for us to maybe overdo it on heated fats so especially if like you're going out to eat a lot um, a lot of times things are cooked like in a saute pan or in a deep fryer or something like that and additionally if you are getting a lot of like processed foods at the store packaged foods um, baked goods those all have heated fats as well and so you can think like okay just to give like a an example is like say you have you want to keep a balance right so say you have a handful of roasted nuts and seeds like roasted almonds then you also want to have a handful of raw nuts and seeds now you have a balance there but I would even say go for more of having the cold fats so, you know, I have a healthy serving of olive oil on my salads, um, like if I'm doing like an avocado toast, um, if I'm having like, you know, sweet potatoes or something like that, and they're, uh, I cook them like or I steam them or I boil them, then I'm adding olive oil on top when they're done. Um, so something to keep in mind, you know, Fats sometimes get a bad rap and they are really good for us, but you want to make sure that you are focusing on the good fats. Um, and that would be like the raw and heated ones for the most part.
Okay, so talked a little bit about roasting. Grilling is another dry heat method. And like roasting, um, you want to be, so with grilling and roasting, you wanna be careful that you are not like burning your foods or cooking them too dark. There is a chemical or um, a compound, I guess it's called acrylamide, if I'm saying it right, but it's a human carcinogen and it can form um, from chemical reactions in food when they're heated at high temperatures. So, you know, if you are like toasting a piece of bread, you wanna, just lightly golden brown toast it you want you don't want it to be like burnt at the edges you know i would scrape those pieces off or just make another piece of bread and same thing when you like say roast your veggies don't go to the point where they're getting like kind of brown and dark brown and like burnt on the edges i would go before that is happening um the longer you're cooking those foods the greater amount of that carcinogen can potentially be created um, and uh, what you can do is if and the same thing goes for grilling again so like you don't want to be burning things um, but what you can do with grilling is to help with um, blocking carcinogens when you grill is you add rosemary so you can apply rosemary to steaks and hamburgers and on the grill and it will break up those potentially cancer-causing compounds that form when meat is cooked. Okay, so um, another dry heat method is sauteing. So as I mentioned before, you want to be mindful of added oils when you are heating those up for cooking purposes. So you know, there's going to be times where you're going to want to heat something up in a saute pan and that is perfectly fine. Um, so say you use like, um, you know, recommended oils would be like avocado oil or olive oil or coconut oil. And if you are putting that directly into the pan, maybe consider taking a paper towel and using that to um, wipe the oil around the pan so you get that non-stickiness, but you're also sopping up like any excess oil. Another option would be to use like a spray variation to lightly coat the pan. And um, you wanna avoid oils that are um, refined or high in polyunsaturated fats. So that would be like corn oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, soybean oil, grapeseed oil, and those kinds of seed oils, sunflower, safflower, all those. But you know, a good go-to is just having like avocado um, oil and olive oil handy. Those are the ones I primarily use the most. Like I try to stick to the ones that are more so liquid at room temperature. And then I use other um, fats like coconut oil and ghee more sparingly because they are saturated. They are solid at room temperature. And if you want in what you could do in addition is if you wanted to just like not worry about you know heated oils at all is that when you're sauteing you're just cooking in water or broth and you'll get that same kind of non-stick in in those um, like methods as well okay so find the balance you know i have a friend that um you know um used to always get like frozen meals and his fridge would be like full of frozen meals and that's what he ate for a really long time and then you know he slowly started cooking more of his foods and now he primarily like sautés or air fries but like that's way better than having like the processed food that he was having more regularly so like there's steps you know you don't have to like you know, don't freak out if you're like um <laughs> roasting or um grilling everything right now and thinking that you have to like steam everything it's like good better best but maybe you work on incorporating like steam trying you know for steamed vegetables or poached fish or um like boiled chicken more often than you do now but you don't have to um do that for every single meal so find the balance for yourself there um i want to talk next about um so i have a 
comment. What should I look for when buying available? Um, v, let me see. Sandra, let me know um, if, uh, I just need to know what you're looking to buy. If it's like appliances or foods or things like that. And um, I'm happy to answer that question for you. Um, but the next thing I want to go over is, so we talked about kind of like cooking methods and I will circle back a little bit to that. But before I do that, since we were talking about sauteing is what type of cookware to use. And so there's certain cookwares that I would avoid. So one thing is don't use Teflon. So Teflon is um, popular because it's nonstick, but unfortunately it can also leach toxic chemicals at high heat and contain chemical compounds um, that have been linked to cancer. Um, you'll also want to avoid um, cookware made from aluminum or copper. Aluminum is one of the most common metals we, pre we see presented in clients when we do nutrition response testing. And elevated aluminum levels have been linked to central nervous system diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS. And even though um, aluminum and copper cookware is usually coated, the coating is prone to chipping. And unfortunately, at that time, you can release toxic chemicals or toxic metals into your food and later into your body. So it's basically the metals are going into the food, you're eating the food, and then they're going into your body. Um, so the same thing goes with aluminum foil. I would avoid that as well. And you could use parchment paper in, as a better alternative. Um, but uh, cookware that would be good to use would be, so do use cookware such as um, like a cast iron skillet. It heats up really well and evenly and doesn't leak anything toxic into your food. Um, you can also use food grade stainless steel. Um, it is, um, it's relatively lightweight and it's resistant to scratches. Okay, what type of avocado oil should I buy? All right, so one I know off the top of my head is Chosen. Um, that's a good one. And I, it's a pretty popular one too. Like I see it at Sprouts and at Costco. So I know that brand, it's, it's not the only one, but um, I have tested that one on myself and also, um, read done some research on different avocado oils and that one's a good one um sandra if you have an avocado at home oil at home that you use and you want to bring in to get it tested we can do that too um, another good um cookware to use is glass um, so glass is great because it will never release anything toxic when it's heated it's environmentally friendly and it doesn't hold on to old flavors and smells so you could use that for like casserole dishes you can get also like um saute or not saute but like glass pots um, it's not so great for nonstick. Um, but it is really good for those other methods. And also glass is really great for storing your food. Um, you can put it in the freezer and it's safe. You can put it in the refrigerator and it's safe. Um, you can also like heat it up in an instant pot to heat up your food. And I will talk about that in a little bit more, but it works great for that as well. Um, another option would be 100% ceramic cookware. So not ceramic coated, but actually like 100% ceramic ceramic. It is a little bit more expensive, but it lasts a really long time. It's made with um, completely natural materials. It's non-toxic and it won't chip or peel off. Um, all right. So I uh, talked about cookware. Um, I want to um, give you some don'ts for how not to cook food. So one of my don'ts would be to don't cook or reheat food in a microwave. So based on clinical studies, continuing to eat food that's been cooked in a microwave can cause long-term and permanent brain damage. It can also halt or alter hormone production in both men and women. And microwaving food reduces or alters the minerals, vitamins, and nutrients so that your body really just doesn't get that much benefit from the food that you're trying to cook. You're welcome. 
<laughs> um, minerals can be converted into free radicals, which are linked to cancer. And then additionally, uh, the human body absorbs these altered compounds in the microwaved foods, and then it's unable to break them down. So, um, again, good, better, best. And if you are cooking everything in the microwave, then you, you maybe you start to reduce and try these other options. If you want to, you know, go hard on it, you can go ahead and just get rid of your microwave and it'll kind of force you to try those different options. Um, so, you know, when it comes to reheating food, especially, you might be thinking, well, how am I going to reheat food if I don't have a microwave? So a trick I have for you is to use an instant pot, which again is like a pressure cooker type device. But what you can do is say you are heating up we do this at the office because we have an instant pot in the kitchen and we don't have a microwave but you put whatever food you're trying to heat up in like a glass container like a pyrex bowl and you want to put like the wire rack in the instant pot which is stainless steel and you're going to put like an inch of water in there uh, and then you'll put the glass container on the wire rack. You'll close the Instant Pot, seal it, and then you'll put it on steam. So for heating up foods, like, you know, heating up my lunch or something like that, it's usually just like three to five minutes. Um, and then it'll be warm and ready. So it does take a little bit longer than the microwave, but just put it in there, do, do some chores around the house, get some work done, and then it'll be ready soon enough. Um, you can also cook in an Instant Pot because it has the steam setting and it cooks a lot faster. So like things like root vegetables, sweet potatoes, pumpkins, uh, pumpkin, like I use the Instant Pot a lot for that because um, you can cook so much at once and it's so fast. And so you can do a lot of cool stuff in that you can do soups and stews and curries and whatnot. I'm not as versed in um, like Instant Pot recipes, um, but um, I think that they would be really good. Okay, it would be a really good option. Um, another method I would avoid is deep frying foods. So similar to um, the roasting and the grilling, um, deep frying food also um, can produce carcinogens like the acrylamide that I had. Um, I'm going to get to the air fryer in just a moment. Good question <laughs> that we talked about. So especially with starchy fruits like potatoes um, and baked goods, they have they can potentially have higher concentrations of this carcinogen. So something to be mindful of. Um, fried foods have more calories than their non-fried counterparts. So if you're working on losing weight or maintaining your weight, it will significantly increase your calories if you're deep frying food. And people who or individuals who regularly consume fried foods are at a higher risk of um, hygiene of um, developing um, conditions like two, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. So, you know, air fryers are like hot on the market right now and a lot of people use them. So a couple things that I would keep in mind with a hot fry with the air fryer, excuse me, is, you know, like I told you with um, like baking or roasting and grilling, don't put the food in there dry. So like if you are cooking a protein or veggies, then um, put it in there dry, no oil, you can use your salt and um, whatever seasonings you want. If you, you can lay parchment paper in your air fryer to have it be like, you know, nonstick. Never put the parchment paper in there by itself. Always have like food in there with it. Um, and then when it's done cooking, let it cool down for a little bit and then you can add the um, raw oils on top. Another thing to keep in mind with the air fryer is what is it made out of? So um, there are air fryers that are made from, I don't really actually sure, but it's like the black coating. But what I would say is just for like peace of mind, go for an air fryer that is like made from stainless steel. So I have an air fryer at home that's like, it's a convection oven 
and an air fryer like you can do and a toaster you can do like any of those options and so it is stainless steel so it won't leach any like toxic metals into your food um so that's something that like it's like with those dry heat methods use them from time to time maybe don't use them for every single meal but i think you know we have to find a balance and it's nice to have variety in cooking styles so it's not a bad thing but you want to keep a few things in mind with that okay so if you guys have any other questions about this topic feel free to plug them in in the chat and i'm happy to answer those for you and um next week I'm going to be talking about gut health. <laughs> gut health. So what are the signs of a healthy gut or maybe um, a gut that is in a little bit of an imbalance and some natural remedies that you can try to support your gut health. Um, digestive, you know, at Natural Healing Center, we put such an emphasis on digestion. It's really where we start with all our clients um, because, you know, if you, we want to make sure that you're able to break down your foods, absorb the nutrients from them, um, that you're able to um, have the stomach acid that you need to, um, support your immune system to break down your foods and so for like the first like six weeks of the program that we work with clients on it's really all about digestion and getting that in place before we can dive into um, other stressors that might be present on the body um, and so we see clients with all sorts of digestive issues whether it is stomach discomfort or pain whether it is related to um, like heartburn or GERD, or maybe it's, you know, irregular bowel movements, diarrhea, constipation, all that. You know, we've had a lot of clients experience really good success in improving their overall health and addressing those areas of concern. But we do um, see clients with all sorts of different health concerns. So maybe it's digestion or maybe it's hormone imbalance, headaches, skin issues, fatigue. Um, and we keep all those symptoms in mind but what we're really after is why are those symptoms happening in the first place so what kind of imbalance or stress is going on in the body that is leading it to have these symptoms manifest and sometimes you know those stressors might be related to chemicals or metals given the environment given the quality of our air food and water um, it could be related to um, an immune challenge whether it's a virus bacteria parasite or other pathogen it could be related to scars um, you know some some scars that we find really bug people would be like c-sections sometimes piercings from like belly buttons um, anything on the midline um, you know, there's in Chinese medicine, there's uh, what are called meridians, and it's how um, it's like the pathways of how energy travels through the body. And when you have a scar that is on a meridian, it can potentially like be blocking that flow of energy. Other stressors might be like radiation. So think of EMFs from your phones, your Wi-Fi, GPS, so many different sources that we're bombarded with every day. Um, so we want to work to identify those areas of stress on the body and then also what might be causing that stress and work with you through making changes to food and lifestyle and with the addition of appropriate supplementation, bringing your body back into balance. And it really starts with a, um, let me just want to make sure I get this question. Hold on. It really starts with initial consultation. And that's when we go over the, um, we test to see, um, uh, we do a day of testing to see what presents itself in your case and then also a day to go over the results. So I usually lightly see my veggies in a pot and a little bit of water. Yes, so very good. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so if you are boiling food, it's really good to 
use like a, as minimal water as possible. And so what happens is you'll have some nutrients leach into the water and then with the little water that you use, it'll be more concentrated. And then you can keep that water and you can drink it or you can use it as like a, in a stock or sauces. And that's a really good way to make sure that you get like all the nutrients from your food that way. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, as minimal water you can to boil your foods would be really, really good. Okay. All right. So um, with that initial consultation working with me, it's the typical price is $2.99. If you are a, haven't been here before and you um, mention this um, recording on <laughs> cooking healthy cooking tips, do's and don'ts, then um, we can apply a $50 discount to um, that service and it would be um, $2.49. Okay, and it really gives you um, a snapshot of your, of your overall health and also a roadmap to your healing. Um, and uh, we work with clients in a program, uh, so working with them over time to make sure that they're getting better, that we're using the muscle testing to monitor their progress, we're addressing anything else that comes up, and it's really that that time with us working together that allows us to see great, such great progress with our clients. Um, you know, if we wouldn't be able to do it with just one visit. So, but with be that said, the initial consultation does give you so much information. So anyway, if you have more questions about that, feel free to write those in the comments and I'll be back here next week talking to you about gut health and thanks so much for joining me this evening um, i will see you guys soon and take care and have a wonderful night